Welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Radio with your host, Deborah Bailey. When I started this podcast in 2008, I was on a mission to promote women business owners, creatives, and entrepreneurs. In each episode, my guests provide resources, valuable tips, and inspiration. Women Entrepreneurs Radio is about showing women how to harness their natural strength to achieve success on their own terms. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Women Entrepreneurs Radio with your host, Deborah Bailey. I am so glad that you're joining us today. And I want to introduce my guest, Alita Miranda Wolf, and she's dedicated her career to help infuse organizations with diversity, inclusion, and belonging that employees need to feel accepted, to be their best selves, and to do their best work. And she's the CEO and founder of Ethos, a full-service diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, EIB, transformation firm closing the opportunity gap for underrepresented and underserved groups in companies through consulting, training, and programs. And Lita's first book, Cultures of Belonging, Building Inclusive Organizations That Last, releases in February 2022 from Harper Collins Leadership. Cultures of Belonging provides clear, actionable steps for you to build new values, experiences, and perspectives into your organizational culture. So welcome to the show, Alita. Thank you so much for having me, Deb. I'm excited to be here. So before we get uh, more into detail uh, with your work, could you please share with everyone how you got started in this work and with your company? So one of the jokes that I often tell is that I never, ever, ever wanted to be an entrepreneur. And the first time I heard the word used, I was 16 years old. I grew up in a Cuban family. And when I asked my mom what an entrepreneur was, she said, that is a person who is unemployed and doesn't want to say so. So then I found myself many years later working in venture capital on the other side. So as an investor in technology companies, and the entire time I worked there, I said, I never want to start a company. I don't want to do it. I'm too risk averse. I'm too focused on things following a linear and straightforward pattern. And then lo and behold, I have been running my own company as an entrepreneur for the last four years. So I will say that I have often said that my version of humility is being more focused on learning than being right. And I think that my entrepreneurial journey is a big testament to that. To make a very long story short, I was looking for this company to join. I wanted to be part of a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging transformation firm. At first, I thought I was going to find this opportunity inside of an organization. And as I looked at opportunities, I realized two things. One, it didn't really exist in Chicago when I started in DEIB. And so finding the function was going to involve making it no matter what. And two, the folks that I was trying to work with were interested in hiring me as a consultant to do the work. So ultimately I decided there is not a market yet. I will have to create it. This is the work I feel called to do. And it's aligned with my purpose and my values. I think that my statement in life comes down to kind of three core phrases, teach love, heal harm, and scale belonging. So with those in mind, I set out to start Ethos, and it's been a little bit less than four years. I started out as a solopreneur. Now we're a team of about 11. We'll be 15 at the beginning of next year. So we've been on a growth journey, and I can say that in some ways, my journey is like many other entrepreneurs. I felt that I had no other choice but to start the company because I couldn't find one like it to join. In your work right now, I think obviously um, it's extremely timely. And I would think that space is really a place that can be extremely transformational, not just in corporate, but in individual 
smaller businesses, which, you know, mostly America is small business. So is that what you're seeing as well, that this is work that really can also affect the small business owner? So the majority of our clients are between anywhere 50 employees to 1,000 employees, which is what we would consider small to medium-sized businesses. And Mm -hmm. what I can say absolutely is that as we know, the U.S. economy is powered by small businesses and where the real demand for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is coming from is employees. And Mm -hmm. we're seeing it coming up in different ways, but especially for younger millennials and Gen Z employees, it's no longer a nice to have. It's in their top three requirements. Mm -hmm. And so there was a time when an organization that was 15 people wouldn't reach out to a firm like mine. And now now we have several we're working with and they're not just in the nonprofit or social impact spaces where there's often mission alignment and a sense that the commitment to the community has to be taken further. This is really organizations that are hearing from their employees that this is a requirement for them for their own experience and also for their commitment to a larger goal of social justice. So usually when you are introduced into a new organization, what usually do you do? Do you connect with the employees first? Do you just take a look at what's going on overall in the company? Usually what is your strategy to get started now? Well, I think I said this before, Deb, but I tend to be a very structured and linear person. So we do a lot of different things with our clients. And one of the things that I just have to say is every single workplace environment has a different flavor and character. So there are practices, especially equity practices, we want to see everywhere. But I would say no strategy is exactly the same for organizations because they're so influenced by the people who are in them. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we need to determine is what is our starting point for an organization that has not done an ADAIB before that might be starting with learning programs and we have training across the board. So whether we're talking about social identity, whether we're talking about implicit bias or upstander intervention, we are very focused on the adult learner mindset. And something that has always stayed with me from when I got my DEIB certification is adult learners are different and they're different in a few ways. The first is that what they most want in their learning experience is agency and choice. So whatever we're doing, we have to put them in a position to be decision makers, even if that makes the conversation or the exercises more uncomfortable. The second is that adult learners want to be doing as much as possible. So our model is called a one-thirds model, one-third content, one-third small group exercise, one-third discussion. And the idea is We are taking our learner and we are shifting them from being passive to active, which is really important when you think about all of the competing priorities that these folks have in front of them. We also really want to focus on what it is that is most top of mind for them today, which means that we have to update our content quite a bit because depending on the day, the week, the geography, the mix of folks in an organization, they could be experiencing different things. And that's why any training we do, we're in discovery before we build out the curriculum. We also have a really active consulting practice and where most organizations start with us is an assessment and roadmap. So an assessment is using a few different lenses to evaluate where the company is. And to your point about talking to employees, Absolutely. So we survey, we focus group, we interview, we conduct ethnographies where we go to the physical space or uh, shadow the virtual space. And we also do a full audit of any practice, procedure, anything that impacts the way that the overall employee community experiences the organization and the larger community, just depending on who they serve and what they do. But we work on everything related to our R2P2 model. So recruiting, retention, promotion, and protection. The thing that I want to emphasize about that model is you could look at it and say, well, that would work for anything related to people or people operations. Our focus is to close the opportunity gap for underrepresented and underserved groups. So when we talk about protection, 
we're not talking about risk management and compliance like you would in human resources. We're asking the question of what makes your employees feel safe, which is a question that I recommend anybody running a business is asking on a regular basis and seeing if they have the structures in place to really answer to. That might be a healing circle. It might be an employee assistance program. It might simply be critical mass and making sure there's more diversity within the organization because there are going to be a variety of answers. The point is that we are really digging into the research to find out in this ecosystem What are those answers and how do we build a strategic roadmap that's practical and actionable within three months, six months, and 12 months? We want to keep it at a year because diversity fatigue is real. And the truth is most of these organizations are majority dominant group. What I say about that is I can use myself as an example. So I identify as a white assumed Hispanic cisgender woman with an invisible disability. One of my dominant identities is that I'm cisgender. That means that the sex I was assigned at birth aligns with my gender identity and expression as a woman. So what does that mean for me? As a leader in my organization, I have to prioritize and make the decision every single day to learn about trans rights and trans issues and make sure that our company is set up to support trans employees. If I were transgender, I wouldn't have to make the decision. I wouldn't need a reminder because it would be my experience. So when I was setting up a health insurance plan, since I would be on that plan too, I would make sure that there were no transgender exclusion clauses, which are clauses in health insurance plans that are fairly common that basically say that nothing related to gender affirmation surgery or hormones that support transition can be covered under insurance. As a business owner, I have to know to specifically request for that clause to be removed in order to support an employee. Now, I am cisgender. Unless I was doing the research and doing the work or it came up with an employee, it wouldn't occur to me. And so what I am often talking about when I talk about diversity fatigue is if you never have to think about those things and now you think about all of them for the 12 social identities we study constantly, it will tire you out, especially because the pace of progress is slow. We do live in a society and we can make improvements in our companies and those companies don't exist in bubbles. So we are impacted by all of the social inequities inside and out. And that can be tiring. You might just choose to ignore it. And that's why we need quick wins. And that's why we need plans that are contained and relatively short term. There are a lot of firms who specialize in three-year plans. And I have no problem with that when an organization is already mature in DEIB. But when you are starting or even at the middle, there's just the element practically of making sure you have buy-in and that you're retaining it. So is there any point where you would recommend that a company really starts to look into this? Because I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of companies are established and, and that's how you're connecting with them. But if someone right now is a entrepreneur and they are forming a company or they're really starting to add people, um, into what they're doing, is there a point where they should really start to look at this? Should they start? at the beginning now to to start to consider possibly bringing in uh, someone like yourself and your team? So I do think that it is important for an entrepreneur to bake DEIB into the structure of their organization. And the places to start when you're at the very beginning of running your company are to think about your vision, your values, and your mission, and how they tie to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. When you start hiring is when you should talk to somebody like me. So whether that's one person or 40 people, it's when you start growing the team, because the reality is we cannot be inclusive. We cannot create inclusion and belonging strategies until we have some diversity, because we have to be able to hear from our employees, to hear from our communities, to design for them. I often say this, It's from the disability justice movement, but nothing about us without us. So 
What we don't want is to be deciding what the best interventions are going to be without having those relationships. Now, when you decide that those relationships are concrete enough that you are going to start designing for them is really up to you. And I can give an example, going back to health insurance, we offer health insurance to both part-time and full-time employees. So if my first employee was part-time, I would already want to be thinking about those policy decisions. But what I would say is having your North Star and what your philosophy is around DEIB and how you want to live it in your organization and then designing your structures and policies around it, especially by working with folks in a more advisory capacity versus a more formal capacity can be really valuable. And I just want to note, I did this. So my organization was five people when I hired my first disability consultant. And a big reason why is while I identify as someone with a disability, that entire spectrum is extremely diverse. And I have a complicated relationship with my own social identity. It's taken me years to publicly say that I have Mm -hmm. a disability. And so it was important to me that in keeping with our ethos, no pun intended, we brought in a consultant who could help us think differently about how we were educating, about the tools we had in place, about the specific practices and policies we might put into place, and also how we were educating ourselves in terms of the language and best practices. And it had impacts across the board. There's not a single session that we lead that does not include captioning for example. And that was the decision we made collectively as a team with the guidance of an expert who was also, frankly, at that point in time, right for our size and right for our price range. And you're saying as far as there is burnout, but from the side of an expert like yourself, is there any point where you feel like you have to breathe and take a step? Well, I just finished the arduous process of writing our employee handbook, and I made the specific decision that I was going to write that handbook from the perspective of an employee trying to use it, which actually makes it much harder because there's way more back and forth with lawyers. (laughs) Because an employee handbook, it says employee handbook in it, but it's really written to protect the company, not to serve the employee. And so I wanted to do it differently. And so did our VP of strategy, Lisa Tomiko Blackburn, who collaborated with me on it and is also an attorney. So as we were going through it, This was a place where there were moments when I felt overwhelmed because I would be in our leave policies and I would realize I don't have a domestic leave, domestic violence and sexual violence leave policy. Okay, we have a lot of policies in here that support trans rights, but we don't have a transgender inclusion policy that shows how we will support someone when they transition while at the company. Okay, so there's that. When we think about disability, we have a few different kinds of medical leave. What differentiates them? We have a reasonable accommodation section. As I was writing it, I felt really confident. And then I realized, what are our cultural and religious accommodations? Because I've only focused on the ones related to ability. So it was overwhelming. And part of how I managed the process was I just kept tagging and flagging when I thought something should exist. I reminded myself that a handbook like this is a living document. I made sure to put that in the introduction and invite folks on my team to volunteer questions that they might have to help with those policies. I also have to say that working in this space, I took advantage of the Brave Space and Inclusion Next work, which are two Slack groups focused in DEIB, to say, what is the best domestic violence and sexual violence leave policy you've seen? Why? And it ended up being extremely helpful. Similarly, when I was looking at uh, different advocacy organizations, nonprofits, and think tanks that focused on social identity, that made life a little bit easier for me too. So it can help to just have your categories laid out. And so this is where I will say gender identity, sexual orientation, racial and ethnic identity, tribal and indigenous affiliation, body type and size, caregiver status, ability and disability, nationality and citizenship, 
right? Like you start to make your list and then you can cross reference against it. What issues might impact? But I would say Mm -hmm. to any entrepreneur is this, when I turned in my employee handbook to my attorney, he said that it was like three times longer than anyone (laughs) that he had seen (laughs) that when you start, they're short and you add on. And so that's what I would say to folks. And I would also say some of those policies came to mind because I had done that visioning work previously. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I wanted a really robust sexual harassment policy in place, especially one that related to our clients because we're client facing. And I know from doing this work that there is not a whole lot of policy and protection when we're talking about employees and their clients. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, and I said that this is going to be a place where we advocate for employees, especially our own, then I know that I have to write that into my policy. And that's where being really aligned to your values is so, so useful in this Mm -hmm. process and can make it feel a little bit less overwhelming. Mm. That's true to know what you're doing and, who you're doing it for, what are your goals? As you said, your values and all those things are, are extremely important because what you're going to do should, of course, line up with them. And I think that brings me to another question because as far as, you know, from the employee point of view, it's easy to be very cynical because I've worked in corporate and there's lots of nice words sometimes but the action isn't really there and you start to feel frustrated or you just don't have a high expectation. So when you have worked with, um, let's say, employees, have you ever faced where they are maybe skeptical or just not really expecting that this is really going to lead to what they may like? Absolutely. And I think that where we have been able to address this the most is just making our promises and keeping them. So for example, when it comes to reasonable accommodations, we've made many and we've made sure not to make them a big deal. We've also made it a point, and I can speak for myself in this way, of naming the ways in which I take advantage of the benefits of the policies of the practices we have in place. We've also made certain decisions to help with this because the cynicism is only growing. And part of that has to do with there was a lot of upsurge in hope and optimism after George Floyd was murdered and the national protests broke out. And a lot of employees thought this is going to be a real sea change in organizations. Mm -hmm. And it's not. There is definitely movement, but it's incremental and slow. And many of the organizations that were the loudest about their support of, let's say, Black Lives Matter, have not done anything but voice that support. And so, for example, when we're talking about the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, or we're talking about Julius Jones' bid for clemency, I I made a decision to send a note out to the team. I had already heard from one employee that they did not want to have a discussion team-wide about it because it was too emotional for them, too difficult, and they wanted to keep their head down. So I wanted to respect that, and I didn't want to just write a statement. So I sent an email to everyone inside of the company, not outside of the company, inside of the company, that basically listed all of the actions we had taken the donations we had made, the legislators we had called, the policies that we had uh, and petitions that we had signed for. So what are we doing about the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict? What are we doing to make sure that Julius Jones is not just exempt from the death penalty, but released from prison? But then the next section was we have prepaid for these resources for you. So everyone in the company could take advantage of TalkSpace, which is um, online therapy that we would sponsor and a reminder that our health insurance sponsors therapy and that you are welcome to schedule that at any time during the work day, which is something that we uh, don't force people to do, but emphasize because we are care workers. And so, you know, we are professionals helping people often on the worst days of their lives. Where do we go to decompress? With that, I also provided a link to an organization that we really trust that leads Healing Circle so that you wouldn't have to be with the team if you wanted to process and work through it. And I also let folks know that I reached out to some of our clients in the criminal justice 
space, specifically abolitionists and criminal justice reformers, to ask what would be really meaningful action right now. And there was no kind of lofty language around it. It was basically, here's what we've done. Here's what we have for you. Here's what we plan to do in the future. If you think we should be doing more, and we should, we know this isn't a comprehensive list. Here's how you let us know. And I'm not saying that it was the most amazing email ever sent. I don't think anybody was writing home about it. What I can say was that I had employees respond to it and say that they felt secure in the organization, that the fact that we can always point to our actions and that we can have a list of those actions and planned actions for the future is is part of why they can show up and do that work for our clients. And there's one instance in particular that has stayed with me forever, which is after George Floyd was murdered, I was on LinkedIn and there was a prospective candidate. Uh, we had a role open for a marketing associate and she emailed me, not emailed me. She LinkedIn messaged me to say, okay, you who run a DEIB firm, so it's somewhat confrontational, what are you even doing about this? And so I responded and I said, here are the seven actions we've taken. Here's the protest, safely protesting guide that we've put together. Here is uh, the day off that everybody took to protest or clean up after the protest. These are all of the folks who are on sabbatical who identify as Black on the team and do not want to teach during this time, who are not working. Uh, here are the mutual aid organizations we've donated to. Here are the on the ground media outlets we've donated to. Here is the resource kit for supporting employees we've put together for our clients. Here is the list of commitments we've made over the course of the year to support Black lives. And here is a tracker on our website where you can see whether things are completed in progress or not started. And she totally <laughs> changed her tone. Like she responded, <laughs> thank you so much for your service and for your support during this time. Mm. And so that's often what I tell my clients, do something. Don't just say something. And often when you do something, remember that you have to tell people that you did it because otherwise they won't know. And so you're so focused on this beautiful polished statement you're putting together. Did you go and talk to your employees about what you did and why you did it? Did you ask them if they had ideas without pressuring them, without being extractive? And that's the approach I prefer to take. With that said, it's not going to work for everyone and it's not going to resonate for everyone. Mm -hmm. What I believe in is providing as many options in how to be helpful as an advocate as possible and to just reframe this question. So we work with clients and the question that is implied is how can an employee meet the needs of the business? And so much of our culture is built around that performance evaluations and candidate scorecards and thinking about revenue per employee. What I ask our clients to do is to turn the question around and say, what is my business doing to meet the needs of employees? That's a very provocative question. <laughs> or it could be <laughs> for some companies. As far as employees, a lot of employees not being in the office or, or in some places they're hybrid, they're in, they're working from home. Has that been a challenge as far as this work? Because some people aren't actually physically in one location. So there are a lot of challenges with remote work and it's a mixed bag because when we mm -hmm. look at the data, what we know is that folks who are coming from underrepresented and underserved groups prefer remote or hybrid environments to live environments because of a whole host of reasons, like not having to cover elements of their identity or feeling like they have more control over their social environment. And at the same time, if you look at the recent study by Project Include on 
basically how remote workers have fared during COVID, what you'll see is that there have been significant increases in race-based hostility at work and gender-based harassment at work since COVID started and people worked remotely. And a big part of that is when we are mediated by technology, we are more likely to do and say things we wouldn't if we were in person with someone. And we see that on message boards and all over the internet every day. What I think folks weren't expecting is that it would happen at work too, through channels Mm -hmm. like Slack and chat. So Mm -hmm. there are social identity based issues that are coming up in ways that weren't before where we had people being much more implicit and covert in their microaggressions and their harassment and discrimination. It's a whole lot more overt and explicit, which is only compounded by the fact that people feel socially isolated because we are not living in a world where people have chosen to be remote. They have to be remote and they still are not fully participating in their social lives and in their communities, right? We're in this kind of semi-lockdown state now for almost two years. And so we know that social isolation is increasing. And we know from a recent study that came out on social wellness that 51% of young people ages 18 to 25 experience extreme loneliness and 61% of young mothers do. They're not getting a whole lot of support in work environments. If you think about a college grad in an organization, what would they do to feel social ties? Well, they would go to the cafeteria or they would go grab a cup of coffee with their desk mate or they would just kind of hang out around the office maybe a few minutes longer at the end of the day and catch up. That's not happening now. And so there is this sense of greater social isolation, which means that it's harder to listen to employees because we're not hearing as much from them. And there's a phenomenon called clustering that happens inside of organizations, which is basically you tend to group together with people who look like you on the basis of physical diversity. I always tell a story. I was observing in all hands for one of our ethnographies and it was live. There were about a hundred people in this space and it's a big open space with lots of row seating. And all of the folks who were man identifying were seated up at the front and the folks who were woman identifying were at the back clustered together. And then the row seating ran out in the back. So there was only seating up at the front. And I just heard the screeching of desk chairs being pulled across the space so that more women identifying employees could sit on the sides by the back with everybody else who looked like them. If you took a picture, you would think that it was an elementary school. Well, when we are talking about virtual environments, You only have to talk to your immediate team. You have even more control over who you associate with, over who you email, who you call, who you Slack, who you have Zoom meetings with. So your circle becomes even smaller, and that circle is much more likely to be homogenous. So we see that that's going to impact a sense of diversity in the organization, but inclusion, because folks who are not in that circle will feel socially excluded. That's true. And um, at times you're going to feel very protective of yourself. So you may not even really try to be a part of those circles if it looks as though um, there's no one there like you because you're almost expecting that this is not going to be a welcoming space. So that's another thing as well. Alita, could you please share with the listeners where they can find out more about you? So absolutely. The first place to start is my website, alitamirandawolf.com. And if you're looking to follow me on social, my Twitter handle is at alitamw. That's actually also my slug on LinkedIn. But here's the trick with LinkedIn. Nobody else has my name. So all you have to do is search it, Alita Miranda Wolf, (laughs) and you'll find it even if you don't remember that URL name. And then I'm on Medium as well if you'd like to read any of the content I'm putting out there. And that's at alitamw as well. On that personal website, you'll find links to pre-order or depending on the time, 
order my book, Cultures of Belonging, which is coming out on February 15th, 2022. If you do happen to pre-order, you will have access to bonus content that folks who do not pre-order will not access, including uh, basically full templates for how to do the work we do in our consulting practice at Ethos. So I highly encourage folks to start a conversation. I love meeting new people and I love connecting over these issues. So I would love a flag or or a tag, or a hello. What inspired you to write this book at this time? So Cultures of Belonging really is my life's work. I've spent the last decade studying belonging. And to put it simply, I've never belonged anywhere. And that's made me really curious about what it takes to belong and how to bake that into the structure of an organization. I have spent really my whole adult life since I was 16 working. And the closest I've ever come to feeling part of a community has been at work. And yet I haven't always felt valued and respected and part of something greater than myself. And I know how valuable that is. As Roy Baumeister puts it, to belong is to matter. And that's a basic human need. So I was inspired to write this book because I wanted to investigate belonging and share everything that I had learned. And I also wanted to essentially make everything we do at Ethos open source. So I wanted to divide the book chapter by chapter into everything that you can do to build DEIB into the fabric of your organization from recruiting, retention, promotion, and protection. The idea being that Instead of having to hire my firm, you could do it yourself and you could start earlier because of something that you said earlier, Deb, which is smaller businesses have more of a shot. They are not dealing with having to transform a pre-existing culture or pre-existing set of behaviors and circumstances. They can start from scratch. And then never underestimate the power of a small team where every single person knows every single other person. When you know all of your employees by name, you might not always have the same level of education in DEIB, but your sense of stakes is really heightened. And I've seen folks who, by all accounts, would be detractors of DEIB, turn on a heel and change because they could associate what was happening that was unjust or unfair with an employee they were really connected to. And so I wanted to make it easy for organizations like those to have a structure, to have a framework, to have ideas so that they could really start from day one. So Elita, this is definitely a conversation we could continue (laughs) with having because there's so much here and so much to go over, but you know, Right now, I just want to ask, do you have any final thoughts to share with us? I would say if folks take anything away from today's episode, it's it's never too soon to start. And it is going to be the small actions that add up over time. So think about every DEIB initiative and action that you put in practice, building up in a bank account with interest accumulating on it. I have always been deeply impacted by Daniel Coyle's research on culture. And one of the things that he found was that in organizations where people say thank you, those organizations are significantly more likely to have healthy cultures as deemed by organizational science research. Think about that. That's not a huge, expensive intervention. That's an everyday practice that people engage in that makes them feel seen and heard and valued and appreciated. So as you think about these ideas of DEIB, consider where you'll have the most impact and start making those investments early, knowing that they will add up over time, especially if you are feeling overwhelmed. You have time. You're planning to build this business into the future. Just make sure you're always keeping it top of mind. Wonderful advice uh, for definitely the business owner who's considering this right now and understands how this can really be a major asset for them and their employees. So, Alita, once again, thank you so much for joining me. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for having me. 
to everyone. I know you enjoyed it. Please share this with uh, your friends, share it on social media, and also check out Lita's book and also check out what she has going on. Um, we'll have links in the show notes so it'll make it very easy for you to uh, follow up on that. So once again, it's been Women Entrepreneurs Radio with your host, Deborah Bailey. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you again next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to stop by womenentrepreneursradio.com to read extended bios of the show guests and also find links there for their websites and any offers that they have shared with you. And stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash womenentrepreneurs.